Hello? Can you guys hear me? No. No? <laughs> it's the con close. Hello? Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Still no. Hello? It's actually the closest I can get to the <laughs> mic. Hello. Yeah, it's working. Because I can't like reach it that way. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Then. then. Uh, I think it's fine. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Can you guys hear me now? Okay. Thank you. So, uh, welcome everyone, and thank you for coming to workshop 130. How, how the social media shape our minds, and we I'm. Not hear you. Hello? Okay. So thank you guys for coming to uh, workshop 139, How Does Social Media Shape Our Minds? Uh, I'm Jian from NetMission.Asia in Hong Kong, and um, I'm the moderator for today's session. So uh, we have an exciting lineup of youth panel uh, facilitators, and uh, we also have a lot of uh, audience from diverse groups and different backgrounds. So to start off the workshop, I'll first give an introduction. And um, this workshop is actually an extension of what we did in uh, youth, youth IGF in Asia Pacific last July, um, where our theme is exactly how does social media shape our minds. And um, looking back at what we did over the past days, speakers mentioned that uh, the ch one of the challenges for youth is that they don't really have uh, interest in internet governance issues or even if they are aware they um, they think it's too technical because uh, they think that um, it's just like for people with technical backgrounds so um, young people I instead are interested in things that are closer to them like social media and um, because we consume it every day and we use it so just to prove a point like how many people in this room use social media can you raise your hands <laughs> so yeah so I think a majority of us actually consume social media but we don't really ask ourselves how it uh, affects our behavior, our attitudes, or the way we think. So um, that's what we hope to talk about today. So um, because, because Net Mission is based in Hong Kong, so the, st the statistics that we have is from Asia Pacific. Um, so you could see that to get a general overview of um, social media use in Asia Pacific, you can see that 40% of the population are connected to, to the internet and 40% of them are active social media users. And if we look at the oh, next slide, please. And if we look at the social media penetration by country, we could see that Brunei is the highest at 89 percent, while the oh, thank you. while the uh, worldwide average is sorry. well, the worldwide average is 37 percent, and Asia is at 29 percent. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Sorry, so this is the, uh, and also when it comes to mobile social networking penetration, we could see that the worldwide average is 37% and Asia is 29%. And when it comes to social media platforms, we could see that Facebook is king. And there is actually a wide gap between Facebook and then the second one, which is Snapchat, and uh, the third one is Instagram, which is uh, also owned by Facebook. And uh, next slide, please. 
So the reason why we youth chose this topic for the Youth Internet Governance Forum is because young people like us or even people who are not young are still frequent users of social media. But like I said in the beginning, how aware are we actually uh, when we consume social media? So we want to provide a chance to raise suggestions and to look at current policies of social media platforms and solutions to the issues. So with that, we hope to create a guide or tips on how to use social media for young people and internet users in general to synthesize uh, best practice and tips on um, usage. Next slide, please. So for our, um, our discussion in Youth IGF in Bangkok, we actually um, have a role play discussion that lasted for three days, um, where the, part the youth participants were divided into three committees, and they have to come up with a proposal for each committee. So the first committee is freedom of speech, the right to be forgotten, and social media and um, advertising strategies. Um, so we did it this way because first we want to, we want them to have the experience of being different stakeholders, and we also want to get the conver conversation going, and hopefully at the end, like I said, provide a guideline and tips of what can work and what doesn't work. Uh, next slide, please. So how does this relate to the this workshop? So uh, we can see that freedom of the three committees, freedom of speech and right to be forgotten, about are about the principles of how social media should be monitored and or operated. And it's important to give a general overview of uh, the situation. And for social media advertising strategies, it's relevant to social media platforms and the way we receive information based on our activities and how aware are we of that. So that is also one of the reasons why we extend it to this workshop. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is just the summary of the proposal from Committee A. So they suggested to have a public awareness raising campaign and uh, through informal education and empowerment. And for the right to be forgotten, these are the points that they have. Uh, creating an affiliated non-political organization, policy and procedure must be created through a stakeholder uh, process. So yeah, next slide. And for social media advertising strategies are um, mostly, these are the proposals from the business side. So um, yeah, this is the summary of it. So we talk about these aspects in the youth uh, IGF in Bangkok recently, but uh, we also want to highlight that and also want to explore today the different aspects, which are which are the methods of receiving information, communication patterns, new innovations, and social media. Yes, so um, for that, I will then introduce our facilitators who will break you out into groups and um, discuss about these three um, subtopics. So maybe we can start with Michael. Could you please introduce yourself? I can do that. Um, so even even I'm like too short for this <laughs> mic. Uh, so my name is Michael Ogia. I'm uh, a Belgrade, Serbia-based independent consultant and researcher, and uh, I'm really uh, I'm very. It's really a pleasure to be a part of this uh, outstanding group. Hi, I'm, I'm also short <laughs> as well. Hi, Dio. Uh, I'm David from Hong Kong, and I'm. Establishing an organization called eHub Association. This is for the promotion on a child online safety internet. So very thanks for that mission and inviting me to uh, engage in this workshop. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sabrina Forbo. I'm part of the InSafe uh, coordination team, the network of safer inter internet centers across Europe. Um, you may know Safer Internet Day. That's one of our annual campaigns that we're coordinating on behalf of the commission. Uh, it's a pleasure being here, and thank you very much for inviting me on this panel. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Guilherme Alves. I'm from Brazil. I'm a journalist, a freelance journalist, and I'm part of the Youth Observatory. It's Latin America uh, community of youth engaged in internet governance. Thank you very much for inviting me. 
Um, good morning, everyone. So this is Heiki. So I'm also from that mission. Um, I'm one of the ambassadors. So um, we're excited to be here and you know, learn more about you know, what are the practices and also like new innovation in your country or cities. Thank you. So um, for, for topic one, it will be uh, assigned to David and Sabrina. And topic two is myself and Michael. And the third one is uh, Gilherme and Hagi. So why don't we say a few words about our topics? So maybe start with topic one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Luckily, I have doing some preparation on that. <laughs> yeah, for topic one is about um, um, the method of receiving information. Actually, right now, uh, there's a lot of information we can find online, uh, especially every one of us are using uh, Facebook or even the other social media. Sometimes we will find that uh, it seems that uh, the content providers will feed the information to us uh, in a sense that we do not really want those information because they have like storing our cookies or, or browsing behavior. So there is somehow we have uh, the discussion on rather this kind of method should be monitored or, or in, in a sense to broaden the horizons on the whole uh, information access. That's why we have these topics about uh, is there any ways to uh, engage us in a, a, a better ways of receiving those information online on social media platform. Thank you. So, um, Regarding communication patterns, like building off of what David said, once, once people are speaking, we, we wanted to address a little bit more about what happens when people are speaking. We want to, we want to address topics like hate speech, um, spreading propaganda, fake news, etc. So w our subgroup is going to be specifically exploring what happens when we are online and um, how people can often misuse uh, the communication tools that they have. Okay, so in the topic three, n innovations on social media, we're trying to understand if like uh, new tools like fact checking and uh, li live uh, transmissions and etc. can uh, are actually working, and how they can uh, help us improve our communities and networks, and if they are not working, why they're not working. So um, now we will have a 40-minute uh, breakout group. So if you want to go to committee uh, uh, subgroup one, two, and then three. So yeah, we can move around, uh, move to the groups that we want. Before um, joining a group, can I ask a question to the panel and, and then know which group I should uh, join? You, you mean you want to ask the facilitators some yes. questions? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, I'd like to uh, maybe paint a bleak picture before I, before I, I ask my question. Uh, recent advances in uh, behavior psychology, uh, which led the progress of neuromarketing, uh, combined with augmented reality and uh, always on devices that we carry, like glasses, etc. Uh, put us in a position of danger uh, where the large organizations like Google and Facebook are able to monitor the availability of our brains. Uh, I'm not as much a user as a younger uh, members of this forum, but uh, I use it and my kids use it. So the question is, how worried are you about the potential manipulation that these devices, by giving uh, your, the availability of your brains to uh, Facebook and Google, can have on, your, on the conscious or unconscious decisions that you are making in your everyday life? I try to answer that. Uh, actually, I think there is about the method of, uh, of course, my subgroup. It's about, about um, the method of like how you can be receiving information is quite similar because uh, as on the online our behavior was stored, uh, like Google have storing our online behavior and also location. And also, as as you know, we are now living in a data bubbles. Somehow is 
uh, when you search the same topics, like like I, I've watched a a a, uh, a TED talk previously. Uh, when you search a topics like Egypt, one uh, who entered the Egypt and in uh, a Google search, they will be showing those information about historical and 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 some tourist spots because he's a traveler. So he, he really loves traveling in a sense. But the other person, he really like uh, the political science that shows those like history and also uh, the political sense and this kind of information. I think uh, that is quite important in a sense to, to say rather they are good or not for those uh, search engine or some rep giant to store our information, but in the sense, I'm just fitting in all the information we lead. It is uh, lead to the question whether we live in a data bubble to, or not. Uh, yeah, so I think we can further discuss in our uh, breakout group sessions. Uh, yes, it is some of my thoughts in mind right now. So, uh, yes. Uh, if I can answer your question on, from my personal perspective, I'm actually not worried about Facebook and Google using my data, as in technology and advancements are the normal. So if they are going to help me by making use of my data, then I'm fine with that. What I'm very worried about is not having the proper checks and balances and not having the control over my data and, and with respect to my privacy and all that. So I would probably be worried more, ab more about that than companies helping me with my data. Thank you. So after we break out into groups, we will actually have a open discussion. So if you have any further questions after your uh, subgroup discussions, then we can open it to the floor later. So um, now, for now, we will break out into groups first. So uh, just go to one, two, and then three. Yes, thank you.
Sorry to disturb the intense discussions in each group, uh, but we're running out of time. I guess each group, please wrap in one minute, and then we'll go into reporting sections, and then we'll have the open mic that everyone welcome to speak again. Thanks.
Hello. So now we will uh, go to the report session of each subgroup and what they have discussed, and then we will open the floor for discussions. So thank you everyone for the discussion. I hope it was very fruitful. Um, so now we have uh, we will have the report for from each um, subgroup. So we can first start with methods of receiving information. So what have you guys discussed? All right. Okay. Um, I hope you can hear me all well. Thank you very much. Um, so we um, our main uh, question was how can we foster critical thinking? So we obviously talked about. Um, fake news um, and um, one of our uh, participants in the group said before actually teaching young people about um, this issue we should um, start with ourselves uh, and um, he also made a nice phrase of referring to teach uh, journalists but then another participant also pointed out that in the case of social media we are everybody of us um, nowadays is a journalist so um, we need to make um, people especially young people more responsible of their action and foster the critical thinking um, also, when it comes to the source of um, the news that we are receiving, it needs to be put into a wider context. And there also needs to be a distinction between people sharing news and also institutions sharing news. Um, because um, if we are honest, fake news have been there um, for a very long time. But obviously, with the internet, they're more accessible, they're more visible to everybody. Um, so also, another question we discussed was, is there regulation um, needed while obviously respecting um, freedom of expression and um, freedom of speech. Um, here again, the challenge is that the internet has no borders, so uh, there are uh, definitely geographical uh, difficulties because social media allows me to post something um, from Geneva, but for example, pretend that I'm uh, in Brussels. Um, so yeah, how um, do we uh, teach uh, the final end user um, also to support um, him or her to ver verifi verify um, news and content they see online. So uh, definitely we agreed that education is key here. And with everything we're doing in our uh, internet governance topic, there's this multi-stakeholder approach um, that uh, needs to be um, followed. We also talked a little bit about social media addiction, social media as um, a drug. What are the side effects actually about this? How can we make terms and conditions for example, more user-friendly, and then um, a good balance between um, positive and negative aspects, but obviously negative aspects tend to um, be more visible and tend to overlap. So here again, how can we foster the positive usage and teach a responsible behavior? The question of, um, yeah, where to click and how to click if I'm um, on the internet. We know social media is very popular. It's a good source, but it cannot be the only, um, the only source. Um, so here again, um, if I uh, read something on social media, I need to find other sources. I need to read different newspapers. Uh, I need to open up um, my horizon. I cannot only consume one-sided. Um, and I also need to um, be pointed to educational resources. So this is a little bit the recap. David, please um, add anything I've missed. <laughs> you have already covered most. And I think one of the very important points is, is not the obligation of just single body. And Sprint have made a very good point for the recap on multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, because like uh, individuals, we have the obligation of like verifying the news and also uh, being safe online, but in the other hand, like the, the uh, web giants, they should like providing some support in like uh, putting also guidelines online uh, and facilitate the discussion and also um, verifying those kind of news and information. So the balance of uh, both parties is quite important in this sense. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Subcommittee One. So um, now for number two. Uh, maybe you can start and I'll add. Sure. Well, I'm glad I took notes then. So uh, so whenever, whenever it comes to, to our group, we, we really hit a multitude of topics. And I wish we had a whole day to talk about everything that was addressed. Um, so uh, multiple aspects came up in our discussions. Um, the first, uh, one of the first ones was about uh, also about terms and services, about how, for instance, um, and actually it was really uh, largely reflective of platform responsibility, about where does the responsibility lie um, with uh, when it comes to what is happening online and how people are behaving. Um, platform responsibility was mentioned, but also um, there was also the role of parents and also and especially the role of individuals i.e um, youth while youth are also um, while youth specifically are often bullied is also youth that are doing the ones that are bullying for instance to other youth um, we talked about um, the concept of whether or not youth care or don't care about privacy um, and about how, and especially, um, we ta we also addressed the psycho the the impacts of the psychological impacts of um, social media and how it has uh, on young people. Um, we oh, uh, one other thing that was addressed it was the idea that a lot of young people are on uh, platforms even if they are not necessarily allowed to be yet. So the the minimum age tends to be 13. Yet a lot of young people will be on um, platforms uh, regardless. So uh, one idea that was broached um, was uh, expanding the idea of kids platforms and having um, even uh, a sub, like for instance, a subdomain where uh, Facebook.kids or something like that, um, as well as the options to opt in and opt out. Um, we, uh, what else? Oh, we addressed the role of media literacy in, um, in addressing content, uh, content issues, whether it be from fake news to um, spreading misinformation or spreading um, or, or spreading uh, hate online, um, we uh, we d addressed quite a bit about cyberbullying as well, especially about how um, how you know not necessarily a, a lot of young people don't necessarily reach out when they need help or when they are being cyberbullied. And uh, also the importance of going into schools and really engaging at the school level if we want things to change when it comes to youth. So those are some of the ones that stood out to me. Um, Jen, did I miss anything big? Oh. And one more is also uh, we were discussing about how uh, uh, somebody raised a really good point about the definition of authority. So for instance, whenever, um, whenever let's say, um, older people, not young people, whatever. Uh, when when non-youth uh, are worried about privacy, it tends to focus more on uh, the government or the private sector, whereas young people tend to focus more on teachers and uh, parents, which, you know, um, so that's a very important point. I think uh, I would just want to add, about we also talked about the shifts when it comes to trends, like the... Um, People, uh, young people are moving from uh, Facebook to uh, Facebook, which is like, uh, um, I mean, mass, uh, like mass audience, to more private um, social media platforms like uh, Snapchat, for example. And we also uh, talked about the difference between um, rights and responsibilities. Yeah. So, um, hope for committee three. Okay, so um, social media have great potential. Uh, we all know it. Uh, we have examples uh, when the use of so social media have made uh, social groups to organize themselves, or we have tools like live transmissions who are very helpful. However, the power of networks like uh, Facebook can make organizations and movements uh, kind of dependent on them, and this is this can be problematic. Uh, Facebook and Twitter, for, as examples, have developed features that put fake news labels on posts, uh, but some cases shows, show these tools may not be working, such as when people uh, do not stop sharing content. On the contrary, they share it more because they believe the label is a way of possibly censor content. Uh, it's also important to say that these labels are placed when possible fake news have already gone viral. Uh, uh, why did we call it fake news only when we talk about online news? 
Uh, there are countries where traditional media is, is historically concentrated and has already been accused of different forms of ma manipulation, but we have never looked at it as a phenomenon as itself. Uh, the idea of fake news was not invented on the internet, so the beta against fake, uh, fake news should therefore contemplate not only the online media, but also the traditional media. Uh, are we becoming more prepared to deal with issues uh, s such as fake news? Uh, or at the same time, we're getting more, even more trapped by social bubbles. Um, and Heike is gonna take it up. Suggestions. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to suggestions, so uh, for social media, so we see a lot of like, potential, right? But for um, the suggestions, so we have the followings. So the first one is that like, social media platforms, so they should be linked with like fact-checking um, sources, so which are reliable, instead of like, just user put whatever they want to put online and then it's not verified. So this is the first part. And then for the second part, so we also want to see you know how credible like those posts are. So if there's a label to show you know whether it has been verified or not, so that'd be helpful. And also um, the show show, and also we talk about you know uh, fake information should be removed or like there should be some label on it and also the last one is that um for social media we want to understand more about like um the algorithm like what who are actually deciding like uh this information should come to users and also you know the decisions behind so we know what is reliable and also you know how we can use the information for like uh the public good so i will see if you guys have anything to add on that from group three okay um Okay, thank you everyone. So now we will open the floor for questions or comments regarding the discussions or the points that were mentioned. So uh, just feel free to raise your hand or if you want to add anything. And please introduce yourself before um, speaking. Hello, uh, my name is Einar Rapp. I'm the Vice Chair of the Icelandic National Secondary Student Union. Uh, I actually have a question towards someone who is not on the panels, but I think it was you who mentioned the uh, different authority figures that children have and which they keep private from. Uh, do you think that their view of authority will shift towards more classical sources of government and private industry uh, as they grow older? Or yeah. so, so just to introduce myself, I'm Larry Maggot, and I'm co-founder and CEO of ConnectSafely.org, which is a NGO based in the United States. Um, uh, clearly, when it comes to the authority figures, sure, as people get older, their authority sh figures shift. So if you're a student, it's going to be a teacher. If you're a child, it's going to be a parent. If you're a college student, it's going to be a professor. If you're an employee, it's going to be a boss. Uh, and at some point, it will be the government when you start paying taxes and uh, are subject to different laws. So yes, I think that, that authority figures will shift. I think that at the same time, uh, we do see trends, if you look at youth generations, and I'm a baby boomer, as I think is probably obvious to you, and also come out of the student movement of the 60s. I was a student leader a long time ago. Um, and what we see from looking at cross generations of student leadership as they mature, that they do tend to bring, or even student activists, they do tend to bring many of those values with them, even though they transfer into different kind of realms. And as people get older, they sometimes will get more conservative in the sense that they have to function more in terms of a financial relationship, but those values do stay with them, which is one of the reasons I am extremely optimistic uh, about uh, your generation or your generation, because there are more than one generation in this room. I think that just as I think my generation was better than my parents, your generation is much better than my generation uh, when it comes to uh, privacy. We, that's the other thing we talked about at, at our session is that youth are more conscious about privacy, yet, but to a different, uh, kind of audience, as we mentioned, uh, even security, and certainly kindness, and, and especially tolerance. Uh, we have found far greater acceptance of racial diversity, of uh, sexual orientation uh, among young people than we do among older people. So uh, if you guys don't change, the world is in for a great uh, treat as long as we can survive the next four or five years and uh, you know, be around for your generation to take over. Hi everyone, my, um, my name is Adisa Bolutife. I'm a Youth at IGF Fellow from Nigeria, and it has really been great to be here. Um, 
I observed the trend of our discussion that mostly the solution lies in educating people about these things, about privacy, about their screen time, and social media. So now uh, I really appreciate the multi-stakeholder system because the youth get to interact with people that are knowledgeable about this stuff. But most times I usually think, what is the action plan? Because we discuss the problems a lot. How do we take the action? And I think um, the action actually lies between the youths because we have the energy, we have the time, we have the passion for these things, and we're able to make things work in our generation. So um, as you know, Internet Society sponsored um, a couple of us from um, developing nations to come to the IDF. So we came up with a project. It's called um, Digital Grassroots. Majorly, we are going to be working with other youth in our communities. We are all youth leaders in our communities. So we are able to interact with people in our communities and let them know the importance of internet governance, privacy, screen time, and all the cool and interesting stuff that we discuss here. So I like to, for the youths, uh, like as many of you to join us, it's really open and it's a very global stuff. And also to the um, stakeholders here, it will be very good for you to support us because you know we can actually get these discussions out there. So um, that's just basically what I want to inform us. So if you like to support us in any way, you can just reach out to me. And thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else has uh, any questions? So, uh, oh yes. No, you, you can ask. Hi, everyone. So my name is Hamera. I represent the Chinese YMCA, and I'm from Hong Kong. Um, so I kind of just want to uh, ask whether this definition of cyberbullying, which is kind of like the topic that we our group discussion ended upon, whether it should be redefined all over. Because we talked about the psychological impacts that social media has on somebody, and I think that it is a prevalent trend i mean i mean it's a prevalent pattern that amongst every age group that uh social media has the same impact psychologically for example we feel uh, like a rush of like dopamine or i don't know the actual type you know the psychological term or we feel like adrenaline whenever we are on social media it's like it's like second nature to us but at the end of the day we none of us actually feel happy after we use instagram or after we use facebook and similarly to go back to the issue of cyberbullying, um, personally, from a few IGFs ago in 2013, uh, we came here with I came here with my team because we won an essay writing competition in Hong Kong, and our topic was investigating the increase of suicide rates with cyberbullying. And I was met with uh, a very knowledgeable person who coincidentally happily happened to be on the table, and he contests. Uh, uh, he contested our topic, and he said that actually there is, has not been an increase in suicide rates with regards to cyberbullying. There actually has been a decrease, but I haven't confirmed that you know uh, idea yet. But then um, I think I found that interesting because uh, few now um, after all these years, I think that cyberbullying could also mean. Um, that it is self-inflicted. So we are all on social media, right? We are all, you know, kind of psychologically attached to social media, but could it mean, I, I, I just would like to ask everybody, you can ask yourselves, like, could it also mean, could cyberbullying also entail kind of this self-cyberbullying? Like, because you are constantly pressured by the amount of people that are in your friends list, you know, you are adding people who are, um, you know, your mom forced you to add your cousins that you don't even know, or your, 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 your friends with your students, teachers, or whatever. Like, this constant psychological pressure that you just, like, at the end of the day, you know, cyberbullying done by other people and cyberbullying done, you know, self-inflicted to yourself have kind of the same psychological effects. It ex affects your self-esteem, it affects your, you know, like your, your prospects in your, uh, in, you know, in real life. So this is kind of like uh, the thing that I want to raise is whether or not cyberbullying uh, has to be defined in, in multiple kind of layers or aspects. Yeah, thank you. Anyone is free to answer? Yes. Yes, if I may, uh, that's, some really good points. Uh, I will say that young people and children especially are especially affected by such psychological pressures 
uh, psychological pressures. 50% uh, of all psychological conditions are present by the age of 15 and 75% by the age of 25, I believe. They just keep getting younger, like, you know, psychological mm -hmm. issues. Yeah, uh, as regards to suicide, uh, suicide rate actually has increased in Iceland. Uh, oh, okay. And is now the leading cause of death between the ages of 16 and 25 for males. Uh, so it's very nice to hear from other countries that they haven't been seeing similar things. Uh, it may be unique to Iceland, uh, but yes, there are some concerns though. I'm not sure, Jeff, but I believe mm -hmm. I was in the chat. Yes, you were. <laughs> <laughs> I want to point out that actually what I said in 2013 was true, but what you said in 2017 is also true, that the trend had been going down since the 90s, and in the last three or four years, teen suicide has gone up. Okay. However, it is very important that you don't confuse a correlation with causation. Yes. The mere fact that these hap numbers happen, that the increase in online, so the point I made in 2013 was just as the internet was going way up, suicide rates are going way down. I wasn't suggesting the internet was causing them to go down, but there's no way to, s but, but the correlation was such, but there's no way to know for sure whether suicide rates are related to cyberbullying. And in fact, what we do know from cyberbullying experts, or from bullying, uh, from, sorry, from suicide experts, is that suicide is rarely a one situation, that, that there are many, many things that enter into it, including mental health, uh, including what's going on at home, and while it, there may be a, a situation where a teen was cyberbullied and killed themselves, that doesn't necessarily mean that cyberbullying was the main cause or certainly the only cause of the tragedy. Thank you. Uh, in respect to cyberbullying and um, sexual harassment, I'd like to mention a group that's often overlooked uh, that we don't talk about, and uh, that group is the enablers. That's all of us. That's all of us who know and who don't say anything. Some of us don't know, but sometimes we do know and we don't say anything. So the enablers have also, they also have to take responsibility and do something. Um, I would like to add to the equation. I. I I work for the No Hate Speech Movement, a campaign uh, to address hate speech and promote human rights online w among young people. What we noticed is young people do realize that there's hate speech and it connects to hate cyberbullying. And for example, when we look at Portugal, we, had two we have two manuals. So one is Bookmarks, which promotes human rights education as a way to address hate speech. It's been introduced in Portugal as part of the curricula for, for ch teachers. And what's very interesting is the feedback that we get is that for teachers, it has been a great opener to actually d d address the digital behavior of young people, the issues of discrimination and discrimination also within the classroom mm -hmm. that is expressing itself on social media platforms that these uh, their youth y y uh, use. And then the next point is that many young people that are victims or are being targeted do not know where to go. So the teachers actually manage that to actually create new awareness among the young people that teachers could be used as a way of opening up the discussion or addressing their issues. We also did, so this is one point, um, where teachers cannot follow these issues online where they have a role to play. More importantly, we tried to do a mapping uh, last year or early this year to actually get an idea of where do young people go to report hate speech, cyberbullying, everything. First of all, it was very difficult to find that information. Even by national people that spoke the national languages, they did not know and they really had to go do extensive search. And in many places it doesn't exist, or it's not really functional, or it's straight away uh, semi-police. So it's, it's a high uh, threshold to go. So I think, uh, I mean, we put on the platform what we could find, but I think there's a real question here of communicating, A, setting it up, B, making a good chain of support from first contact to action where it's needed, and C, to, and to communicate this and to make it function and to also make sure that it works. So I think there's big challenges here um, to, to address. Um, Henry, uh, copy fighters and young pirates of Europe. Um, so there was, a there was a session in this room yesterday on digital civility. Um, and 
I can't remember his name, but there was someone who made a very good point there, that the place where um, the majority of young people go when they feel cyberbullied, when they feel um, attacked online, is to their friends. And um, I hope I'm not inferring anything from the, the comment of the, uh, the lady at the back. Um, but the solution cannot be to simply say, walk away from the computer, walk away from the social media. Because that is where most young people today have their friends. That is w the way they would communicate with them. Thank you. Yes, another point about that specifically. Uh, we have to remember, of course, that cyberbullying is not the only psychological effect that social media has on young people. There's also overuse, uh, I hesitate to say addiction, uh, and pressure is felt by uh, these incentive systems. And not just that, but also the models of friendship have changed a lot. Over the past few years in Iceland, we've seen a growing increase in people who, uh, in young people who report that they feel lonely or that they have no one to talk to. Social interaction has moved away from physical interaction and more onto online platforms and with very emotional interactions that maybe doesn't have the same effect. Um. But isn't it the social media users a in responsibility, the right social media usage of parents <coughs> and the educators because many times they just don't care about how kids they use social media? Uh, maybe uh, the young girl at the back. Um, I'm Connie from the Chinese YMC of Hong Kong. And I believe that one of the most important ca factors that has caused cyberbullying is about privacy because some of the youths don't really understand the regulations for the privacy within social media. And so when they post photos or videos and they, if they haven't like set it up anything in the settings menu, then they wouldn't know where their posts would go or where it will be exposed. So when some people who are really promoting cyberbullying um, comes to these users, then these users don't really know what they can do and they'll feel helpless and that. But what has caused this is because like the regulations are really too long in some of the social media. And let's take like terms and regulations, for example, whenever we set up social media accounts, you have to like take a little box that says, I agree with the terms and regulations. But how many of us actually really like click in and scroll through those thousands and thousands of words and to understand clearly our privacy and our rights in the social media? So it's actually really important for social media panels to kind of like change these regulations, perhaps like simplify these methods and so that the youths can actually really know what is happening with their social media accounts and what will be their effects and also the consequences once they post these um, media things. Thank you. Okay, so since uh, we're actually running out of time, so um, we, I just want to quickly uh, wrap up and maybe have some final words from our facilitators. Uh, so uh, I think one of uh, some points that were constantly brought up was the issue of privacy and do young people really care or know um, about their privacy? And that brings us back to education, which I think each... Um, subgroup actually mentioned how important <laughs> education is and also um, how there is this res uh, responsibility not only for uh, companies or people who um, who have these platforms but also for us who use this platform so do you have any final words to say yep. um, just uh, adding some feedback on uh, the Nigerian gentlemen have mentioned about uh, from youth at IGF program mentioned about actions we can take from the point of views of like civil society of course there's obligation from business sectors and those uh, rap giant but in, in terms of uh, youth or even like so civil society I think 
uh, Women Lab Mission and also Sabrina, you, you guys have done a very, very good work on doing so educations, for example, organizing youth IGF in the region, and also uh, there's a lot of child-friendly internet activities have been organized. So I think uh, the gentleman can take a look on, online on these kind of resources and try brainstorming on, on this and, and work it in your own community. Thank you. So uh, that's it for the session. So thank you all, everyone for coming. So if you want to continue the conversation outside of this workshop, of course, just feel free to approach us or any of the people that you have talked to today. Thank you very much.